And, and, I, and you could probably ask 100,000 people in Toronto and they would have no idea who scored the first goal as a, as a, a Toronto Maple Leaf. Uh, back when well, you said 27, the first Leaf goal, so that's, uh, that's an amazing uh, thing when you look back at it. When the Toronto Maple Leafs celebrate the 50th anniversary of their first National Hockey League game next month, George Franklin Paddy Patterson, the man who scored their first goal, won't be there. Patterson, 70, died here this week after a lengthy illness. The Canadian Press. We never knew. That didn't happen, and we didn't hear about that until after he'd passed away. And I read it in the Wake Standard. For most of North America, the 20s were still roaring. The stock market crash of October 1929 that would trigger the Great Depression, crushing the finances of so many, including a great number who lived in Toronto, was far away. Overseas, China was in the grip of civil war. Stateside, Lucky Lindy had yet to make his daring transatlantic flight to Paris. On February 17th, a bone-chilling night where the temperature dipped to a frigid 17 degrees, sleds drawn by horses shared Young Street with cars. In a cramped and humble arena on Mutual Street, roughly 8,500 fans, mostly men in suits, sat waiting for a new team to emerge from the home side's locker room. By the time young George Patterson moved with his family from nearby Pittsburgh Township to their home on Albert Street in Kingston, Hockey was well established in the city. Like many boys in the area, Patterson was quickly hooked on the sport. And his story, from what I've understood and what I read, was that uh, he simply donned his skates like any other kid uh, in the area uh, around Albert Street, which would have been on the outskirts of Kingston or right on the edge at that time. And he just went down and uh, they simply asked me to play. George said, uh, I think he was, that was a quote to the, uh, the Whig standard, uh, Raymond C. Burr did the article, but, uh, they simply asked me to play, George said, and he just got better and better. Kingston was a hockey hotbed in the early part of the 20th century, stubbornly claiming to be the birthplace of the game, a claim long since disproved. In Toronto, hockey was slow to catch on. Skating and shinny, an informal, free-flowing game of ice hockey, were popular pastimes. But warm winter weather and a lack of reliable ice surfaces slowed the development of organized teams and leagues. It was struggling at the time. Uh, it was struggling. In point of fact, uh, crowds at some of the, uh, or the attendance at some of these uh, games were very minimal. All the hockey world is laughing at a so-called professional hockey league that can only get players that real professional leagues don't want. It's not a professional league at all. It's a disqualified amateurs league. The Toronto Telegram. 
During the winter of 1906, the Ottawa Silver Seven dismantled Queen's University and swept Smith's Falls in their quest for the Stanley Cup. They ultimately fell to the Montreal Wanderers in a split-game series, decided on goals scored. February 1906, Britain launched HMS Dreadnought, making all other naval vessels obsolete and increasing tensions between England and Germany in the process. During the spring of this year, George Patterson was born, May 22, 1906, in Pittsburgh Township, outside Kingston, Ontario. By fall the following year, a hockey war was being waged in Toronto between advocates of an amateur game and those pushing for professionalism within the sport. At the centre was a stubborn and often volatile John Ross Robertson. Head of the Ontario Hockey Association, Robertson brought an almost religious zeal for what he felt was the purity of amateurism in sport to his role as OHA president. As George Patterson found his way onto Kingston's ice for the first time, the Toronto Blue Shirts won their one and only Stanley Cup before disappearing into the fog of history. The Edwardian era came crashing to an end with the Great War, and Scotty Davidson, one of Toronto's best players, was killed during active service. Davidson, along with legendary amateur player George Richardson from Queen's University, also killed in action, served as inspiration for Captain James Sutherland, himself a hockey innovator and historian, when he proposed the Memorial Cup. Of course it was uh, our Captain James Sutherland who has been regarded by many as the father of hockey, but he certainly was the individual who developed uh, what I consider to be the significance and the historical uh, element of the game and uh, created a tradition and a legacy which I th still uh, remains uh, in hockey today. After the war in Europe, another battle waged in Toronto over hockey, this time between the NHL and Toronto Blue Shirts owner Eddie Livingston. So from what I recall, it was, it was a sport that didn't take off immediately in, in Toronto, but it was gaining momentum as it went along. And then, of course, you know, you had the Toronto professionals come along and the Toronto Blue Shirts were drawn by Eddie Livingston. He was in fighting with the NHA, and they then wanted to get him out of the league. And to get him out of the league, they started the NHL. They didn't issue him a license. They issued the license to the Toronto Arenas, which was the Arena Corporation. And then he negotiated with them, and they were, called, they were still called the Toronto Blue Shirts for the year they played, 1917. They lost their first game, and they got 700 fans come to the original game. And they won the Stanley Cup that year. And then the next year, they ran into more financial trouble, which always seemed to be an issue. And then they were bought again by Livingston. And then they turned over and they became the Toronto St. Pats. While the 20s roared, George Patterson quickly became a folk hero as the local junior squad went on a magical run during the 1925-1926 season. As spring 1926 approached, the Kingston Combines, known officially as the Kingston Queen's University Royal Military Combines, made a late winter push that captured the city's imagination. Crowds beyond capacity packed the old Jock Hardy Arena on Arch Street for every home game. The staff at the university was increased on Monday morning to handle the sale and there was a rush throughout the day until the last ticket was sold. The indications are that the rink will be jammed to the rafters. The rush standing room tickets will be far heavier than in the Parkdale game, owing to the fact demand for this game is heavier. The Daily British Wake. After a gripping come-from-behind win against Parkdale, the Combines would face an equally tough opponent. In an unprecedented move, the Daily British Whig opened three phone lines back to the hockey crazed city during road games. But, as with the previous series, it was the home games that created the greatest buzz. 
The teams are ready for the big battle, but local fans seem ready to have much more confidence in their representatives than they did when Parkdale played here last Friday night. They expect the locals to win out tonight, but none seems prepared to say by what margin. Kingston will be given a grueling battle by the Owen Sound team and will win the greatest game of the season in junior OHA hockey. The Daily British Week. After another stunning come-from-behind series win to capture the Ontario Championship, the Combines were off to Winnipeg, where it appeared nothing could stop them from capturing the city's first Memorial Cup. They easily handled Quebec's Sons of Ireland club and then dispatched the team from Fort William. All that stood between George Patterson, the Kingston Combines, and history was a team from Calgary. At one time it was goals to count, and that year they... They changed it to uh, to uh, games, best two out of three games. And if it, if it had been counted by goals, they would have won it in two games. But they, I think they lost by one goal in the, in the final to Calgary. Back in Kingston, a hero's celebration awaited. Hundreds of fans jammed the inner train station and a line of cars waited to carry players along a parade route to City Hall. When the parade headed by two marching bands, arrived at City Hall. Mayor Tom Angrove summed up the mood in the city when he told the assembled crowd the Combines brought great joy that reigned in Kingston today. Among the Combines bathing in the city's warm appreciation that day were Bill Togger, Carl Voss, Team Captain Howard Reed, George Patterson, and RMC's Harland Molson. Team manager Captain James Sutherland, the man who had led the charge to create the Memorial Cup, was also on hand. Soon enough, these players would scatter and each have their own impact on the professional game. Sutherland would turn his attention to another hockey project, creating a Hockey Hall of Fame. And Kingston? Kingston would never again be so close to being Memorial Cup champions. It is learned on good authority that George Paddy Patterson and Harold Buster Hartley, star players of Kingston Junior OHA champions, have signed to play professional hockey in Hamilton next winter. The report also says that Bill Togger, crack goaltender of the team who is now sailing, is likely to sign a professional contract on his return to the city. The report could not be verified this morning. The British Whig Standard. When George Patterson, Buster Hartley, and Bill Togger arrived in Hamilton in the fall of 1926, they found a city madly in love with its semi-pro Hamilton Tigers hockey club. It was common for the home squad to draw 5,000 fans to a game. One team in particular was struggling um, by 1919, and that was the Quebec Bulldogs, uh, also known as the Quebec Athletics, and that was a team that had been in existence since 1888, so a really venerable old franchise uh, for the NHL. Um, it certainly way predated the NHL itself, um, but by 1919, uh, the team was struggling, and uh, it, ownership changed hands, and they were looking for a new owner, and they found a willing owner in the Abso Pure Ice Company in Hamilton. Um, the NHL was very pleased to, to welcome Hamilton to the fold. And so the, the Quebec team was sold to Hamilton and became the Hamilton Tigers. They also found Hamilton still smarting from the loss of its NHL Tigers club not long before. Tigers fans had loyally stood by some poor finishes and were just about to taste Stanley Cup glory when a sudden strike by the home team dashed any cup dreams. And over the next few days, the press just in Hamilton just went wild with this story. Uh, and there was speculation as to you know, why this had happened and there were rumors about uh, all sorts of you know, bribery and this wasn't this was only a few years after the black Sox scandal and so there was you know it was and and pro sports at that time were viewed with with suspicion by many um many people in hamilton anyway the the amateur team the senior amateur team were also called the tigers and they were beloved um and they were made up mostly of local guys um and so they really had an important place in in hamiltonians hearts so this, the, the pro team was always, I mean, they were loved too, but there was always this sense um, that professional sports was compromised um, because of the, the financial incentive and in, in the finances. Local boys star in pro hockey. 
the grand work of Bill Togger in the nets and Paddy Patterson and Buster Hartley on the wings gave Hamilton's professional team the victory over Windsor last night in the first game of the Canadian Professional Hockey League. The Kingston boys were the backbone of the Hamilton team all through the game. The British Whig Standard. Patterson quickly endeared himself to the local hockey faithful with spirited play and soft hands around the net. Even an injury early on couldn't dim his popularity. In a Friday night game against Niagara Falls, Patterson collided with an opposition player and, according to the Hamilton Herald, was knocked down so hard that he tore the ligaments of his right knee. After his two-week layoff, Patterson continued on the same rapid pace that would see him record 17 points and 30 penalty minutes in 23 games played for the Hamilton Tigers. He could be called a power forward, but he broke in, in, in the days when hockey was really a two-line game. You had your ace team played most of the time, and your second team, which was, which, which was a, more of a checking line. As Patterson's play continued to draw attention, local papers such as the Hamilton Herald were quick to heap praise on Tigers manager Percy Thompson for not only discovering the 180-pound tricky stick handler and stealing him away from nearby rivals such as London and Stratford. By January, George Patterson's days in Hamilton appeared to be coming to an end. Three NHL teams were in an active bidding war with Thompson to purchase the winger's rights. When Percy Thompson announced on Saturday that he received a record offer for George Patterson, Hamilton's right wing player, he refused to divulge the amount of cash the Montreal Maroons were willing to part with. The Herald has been able to learn, however, from the Roy brothers of the Stratford Club who made the offer that $5,000 was the price mentioned. To get that amount as well as a player thrown in was a very tempting bait for Thompson, but he turned it down. Speaking of hockey deals, Toronto St. Pat's have also entered the field for the services of Patterson. Their offer came Sunday, but Thompson repeated what he told the Maroons and the Boston Bruins, nothing doing. The Hamilton Herald. While Percy Thompson was entertaining a serious offer from the Montreal Maroons and a faint-hearted offer from Boston, the Toronto St. Patrick's, a team in turmoil, were also making a serious pitch for Hamilton's favorite rough-and-tumble winger. The St. Pats came stumbling into the NHL in 1919 as the result of a protracted dispute between the league and the owner of the Toronto Blue Shirts. In 1922, backed by the brilliant goaltending of a young John Ross Roach, the St. Pats upset Ottawa to win the Stanley Cup. By the 1926-1927 season, the club was in trouble on and off the ice. The on-ice team was a shell of the club that had won the Stanley Cup in 22. Off the ice, the St. Pat's faced legal challenges and financial woes. The club was put up for sale and an offer of 200000 from a Philadelphia group was being seriously considered when a St. Pat's shareholder, J.P. Bickle, made a bold move to try and save the Toronto franchise. He approached the coach of the Toronto Varsity graduates, Con Smythe, with a proposition. He told Con that if he came with him, he would keep his $40,000 in and let him run the team. Well, Con wanted to be a partner in the team. He wanted to be one of the owners. So he said, let me see if I can do something. So in the meantime, he was actually working for the Rangers. He got paid $10,000 to put the Rangers hockey club together. He bought 31 players for a little over $32,000. But the Rangers then fired him because they wanted a more of a name manager to run the team, so they hired Lester Patrick. Let go by the Rangers, Smythe was shorted $2,500 by the New York team. Anger and pride almost kept him from going to Madison Square Garden to meet with owner Tex Rickard during the season opener. Pushed by his wife, Smythe did attend the game and the $2,500 payment was made. Smythe never forgave the Rangers' ownership. Never one to shy away from risk, Con Smythe took his found money and bet on a Hamilton football game, doubling his money. He then took his newfound $5,000 and bet it on a Toronto hockey game and won again, doubling his winnings again. With $10,000 in hand, he went with Bickle to make a bid on the St. Pat's. They convinced the owners 
to keep the team in Toronto and take the hometown discount of less than two hundred thousand and, and bought the team for one sixty seventy. They put ten down, gave them seventy five thousand up front, and they owed seventy five thousand dollars within thirty days. So on February fourteenth, nineteen twenty seven. Conn Smythe officially bought the Toronto Maple Leafs. Although it looks very much as if the Hamilton Professional Hockey League Club will lose its star right wing George Patterson via the sale route, manager Percy Thompson of the locals insisted today that so far no deal has been made for him. Patterson will be at the right wing for Hamilton and Stratford on Wednesday night, he said, in spite of reports from Toronto that he is to join the St. Patrick's of the NHL immediately. St. Pat's have to give us a right wing who can make a good job of filling Patterson's shoes before I will consent to turn him over. The Hamilton Herald. The Hamilton newspaper bid farewell to Patterson with glowing tributes. He may well have become an NHL player, but he was not yet a Toronto Maple Leaf. His NHL debut was in a losing cause as a St. Pat against Montreal. And so three days later, they were still playing under the St. Pat's, Matter of fact, on February the 16th, 1927, they played their last game as the St. Pat's and lost 5-1 to the Detroit Cougars in Windsor, and there was 150 people in the stands. St. Patrick's doesn't mean a thing. The name was hatched as a sop to the Toronto Irish. Our Olympic team in 1924 wore Maple Leaf crest and won. The Maple Leaf means something proud across Canada. Con Smythe. So Con Smythe was very much a nationalist, a zealot when it came to Canada and the mother country in England as well. And, and like a reflection of his times, you know, at that time, and you hate to think about it, but that was very much the time. Toronto's Mutual Street Arena was a cramped and uncomfortable hockey barn on an average winter night. But on the night of February 17, 1927, just days after the Toronto Globe carried news of the sale of the local hockey club with a subheading which read, Goodbye, St. Pat's. Howdy, Maple Leafs. 8,500 fans squeezed in to see what the new Leafs would look like. In the crowd was a young Harold Ballard. His days of torturing the psyche of Leafs fans were still far in the future. Below the general admission bleachers, in an equally cramped dressing room, the team's equipment manager sat in a dimly lit corner and scrambled to stitch a green Maple Leaf logo on what had been St. Pat's jerseys. On the other side of the room sat 20-year-old Carl Voss. Voss was the first rookie signed to a Leafs contract by Smythe. Signed for the remainder of the season for the sum of $1,200, the negotiations had been tense. Because Voss was under 21, Smythe had to deal with the rookie's mother. I'm against professional sport, Mrs. Voss argued, but the money's not bad, Smythe countered. Besides, your boy's big enough to be out earning a living. What Voss saw in the dressing room that night was enough to intimidate any rookie. He was surrounded by Hap Day and Ace Bailey, along with goalie John Ross Roach. Sitting nervously in the room was his old Kingston teammate George Patty Patterson, a veteran of an entire two NHL games. Before the start of the game, Smythe was in the dressing room. He cornered coach Alex Romerill and gave the Leafs bench boss strict orders on how to play Hap Day. Smythe made it clear Day was to move back to defense. Romerill obliged and Day would never play forward again. Instead, he would go on to have a Hall of Fame career, perfect a clutch-and-grab style of play, win the Stanley Cup, and become team captain. But all that was yet to come. On the ice, the Leafs and New York Americans quickly warmed up before lining up for the singing of God Save the King. Referee William O'Hara skated to center ice and rang his bell to start the game. The referee's whistle was ten years away and ushered in the era of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Lionel Big Train Conacher opened the scoring for the Americans as they outshot the Leafs and took a one nothing lead into the first intermission. The Amherst lead didn't last long into the second period. Carl Voss, who spent most of the historic night glued to the bench, had a great view of the important goal to come. The former Toronto St. Patrick's, playing with new uniforms, a new coach, new management, new star player, and a new team name, 
routed the New York Americans tonight four goals to one at the Mutual Street Arena Gardens. The new coach, Alex Romero, put Hap Day back on defense, and the change worked wonders. Day had been on the forward line for the St. Pats. One of the new players, Carl Voss, a big husky defensive player, signed a contract with the Maple Leafs before the game. The Americans scored first in the opening five minutes, with Lionel Conacher passing to Billy Birch, who was uncovered in front of the goal and scored on the quick shot. Midway through the second period, Toronto's George Patterson evened the score at 1-1. The Toronto Daily Star. In their first game, the Leafs would skate to a 4-1 win, leaving the home crowd giddy with the notion a new logo and name could make such an improvement in the club's on-ice performance. Any change in luck was short-lived. Toronto limped to last place, 29 points behind King Clancy and the first-place Ottawa Senators. The Senators would go on to beat Boston that spring in a best-of-five series to capture the Stanley Cup. Conn Smythe would content himself with on-ice success with a different Toronto hockey club. He would coach the University of Toronto varsity grads to the 1927 Allen Cup Senior Hockey Championship. While the city held a parade for its Allen Cup champs, Smythe grumbled, The next time I do this, it'll be a Maple Leaf parade. Yes, uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs were struggling for a while, for a while, and... uh, with the, I would consider to be the uh, brilliant manner in which Colin Smythe, even though he was a bit of a stormy uh, martinet to his players and to everyone with whom he was in contact, still developed into a, 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 a very viable franchise and, uh, and in point of fact, it became a very lucrative franchise eventually. The new Leafs limped to the end of their first season sporting green jerseys with the old Toronto St. Pat's embroidered in very small print. It was an effort by Smythe to keep any pre-Leafs contracts with his players valid until the end of the year. George Patterson finished his 17 games with only 6 points. By midway through his second NHL season, Smythe, who was both coach and manager of the Leafs, had run out of patience with the young winger who had managed only one goal in the first 12 games of the year. Patterson was quickly traded to the Montreal Canadiens. While Patterson would continue to struggle for the remainder of the season in Montreal, being sent to the Toronto Ravinas of the Canadian Pro League for a 16-game stint, he rebounded in his next full season with the Canadians. In the 1928-1929 campaign, George Patterson managed 9 points in 44 games. But the rugged winger was more valuable to the Montreal club for his toughness, posting 34 penalty minutes. Paddy Patterson apparently came into his own with the Canadians for the first time on Saturday. He scored the first goal against the Senators and was one of the stars of the game. Patterson might yet make his name in the playoffs. Montreal Newspaper. That spring, the Canadians made the playoffs. In three games, Patterson didn't manage any points while being whistled for a single minor penalty. As October 1929 approached... The good times of the Roaring Twenties, bootleg booze, and jazz-fueled parties was on borrowed time. After failing to live up to Con Smythe's expectations in Toronto and suffering similarly harsh reviews at the hands of his French teammates in Montreal, George Patterson arrived in New York City looking for a new start with a team that had already cemented its reputation in the NHL as a lovable group of underachievers. The story of the Americans um, in those years, in the 20s, really before the coming of of Red Dutton, um, was that it was a team where you wouldn't expect to win, but you'd have a hell of a good time losing. And that good time was really part of the culture of that team. Uh, You know, it was the liquor. It was living in a hotel a block away from the garden called the Forest Hotel. Damon Runyon happened to live in that hotel, Damon Runyon of guys and dolls fame. Um, Runyon supposedly developed a disdain for hockey based largely upon the antics of the Americans who were living in his hotel. 
New York's Americans hockey team, lovingly known as the Amerks to the locals, was born as the result of one of the city's most famous gangsters taking in a hockey game while on business in Montreal. Big Bill Dwyer had cashed in on Prohibition, making his fortune as a rum runner and bootlegger in New York. The center of his operation was Manhattan. He was an accomplished sportsman with interests in baseball and horse racing when he was approached by the ownership group of the yet-to-be-completed Madison Square Garden about icing an NHL team in the new building. Casting about for players for his new team, Dwyer looked to Canada again this time to the Steel City, Hamilton. The Tigers had just been suspended the previous spring for refusing to play for the Stanley Cup as part of a dispute over higher wages. With almost the entire roster of the former Hamilton Tigers comprising his new team, Dwyer's Americans should have been a force on the ice. Certainly their home ice debut was anticipated with a record sellout crowd on hand at the new Madison Square Garden to watch the city's newest hockey stars. And the home team didn't disappoint with a convincing win over Montreal. Billy Birch, a star in Hamilton, was promoted in New York as hockey's Babe Ruth, while Shorty Green scored the first goal in the new Madison Square Garden. The star-spangled jerseys were a hit with fans, but a miss with the opposition. Geez, what a surprise to see New York in that game, those bright sweaters. They looked like they had come right out of Barnum and Bailey Circus. We didn't know whether to play hockey against them or ask them to dance. Aurel Julia, Montreal Canadien. Almost immediately, they earned a reputation as lovable losers. It became clear soon enough they were a long way from Sleepy Hamilton. You can imagine the shift, um, the, the kind of cultural uh, shift from, from living in Hamilton uh, and then moving to New York City and playing your hockey in Madison Square Garden. So these, it, was, uh, it was quite an adjustment for these players. And, and there's a lot of speculation as to why that was. S certainly um, there was a change in coaching, uh, but there was also a change in environment. And I think a big part of the problem the Americans had when Dwyer was their owner was you had a bunch of you know, Canadian players drop down into the center of New York City uh, at the time of Prohibition, the Jazz Age, lots of liquor and other sorts of activities floating about where they were all residing. And I have a feeling they were distracted. And so a team that in Hamilton, Ontario, no offense to Hamilton, um, does not have the cultural enticements of New York City uh, suddenly find themselves um, not really engaged in what their primary activity should be, playing hockey. Patterson arrived in New York as Wall Street's incredible run of ever-increasing returns came crashing down. The financial panic that followed led to a decade of poverty and human suffering. Back in Toronto, the city would see roughly 30% unemployment by 1931 and a drastic drop in construction. Into this void stepped Con Smythe. With a plan to create a grand hockey palace to replace the long obsolete arena the team called home. The Leafs were just starting to come into their own, buoyed by what was then considered one of the great trades in hockey history. Con Smythe's move to acquire King Clancy from Ottawa. And, you know, he somehow scraped the money together. He did a deal with Eaton's to get the, the piece of property at Carlton Church. It, was going, it went back and forth a number of times as to where they were actually going to put the building. And Eaton's was a little disturbed or a little concerned about building a hockey arena to have a hockey-type crowd walking around their new college park area that they had, which was going to be an upper crust level of people they thought were going to be walking around. But, you know, but Con con them and let them know that it was not going to be that because it was going to be a special brand of person who was going to go to the hockey games that's the shirt and tie and the hats and everybody looked like they was in their Sunday best whenever they attended a Leaf game I and mean, he basically worked just to put food on the table that night alone and that's pretty much what they did and they got that rink built in six months I and mean, again you can never do that to this day while the Toronto Maple Leafs continued to build on and off the ice thanks to the vision of Con Smythe George Patterson was settling into his new role in New York City he was now far removed from the player with the tag of damaged goods placed on him by the Boston Bruins after he broke his jaw and lost a mitt full of teeth while test driving a car he had been fixing at his garage in Joyceville, Ontario. 
You know, the environment um, in the late 20s is the team is, is stabilized as a hockey club, but their finances are in disarray. Uh, Dwyer had gone to jail down in Atlanta for two years. He comes out, and you'd think his problems are behind him, but in fact, they're just beginning. And Dwyer's biggest problems become the uh, Internal Revenue Service in the United States. Uh, they hound him for back taxes. Purportedly, he owes more than a million dollars. He just doesn't have the money. Sweet revenge for Patterson's A's as Americans trim Canadians. Georgie Patterson, who played a couple of seasons as a spare with Les Canadiens of Montreal without receiving a pass from any of Cecil Hart's employees, the flying Frenchmen were almost all French in those days, got all measure of revenge in Madison Square Garden last night. Last Thursday night, it appeared that the Americans were indulging in a little puck shooting with the Montreal Maroons. During the first period, Johnny Shepard, first string wingman of the Americans, sustained an injury to his leg. The Americans' board of control, consisting of Chairman Conacher and President Dwan, held a committee meeting and decided to use Patterson in Shepard's place. Patterson responded immediately by contributing the third goal for the Americans, a counter which nearly won the game for them and which provided the final Yankee counter in a 3-3 tie with the group leaders. Saturday before that, the Americans were hammered by the Canadians 9-2. The two Americans' goals were scored by Patterson. With Shepard still being on the hospital list, the lowly sub, Patterson, continued his activities by hammering home three goals and enabling the much-reviled Americans to gain a 4-2 triumph over their former conquerors. Roger Burtwell, Ontario Press. In his first season with the Americans, Patterson would play 39 games, scoring 13 goals and chipping in four assists along the way. His efforts would be for a losing cause as Big Bill Dwyer's team would miss the playoffs again. The 1930-1931 season would prove to be much more exciting for the Americans and their fans, thanks in part to the play of Patterson and goalie Roy Werders, who had a Vezina Trophy winning season, yielding only 74 goals during 44 games. Patterson would account for 14 points, but the rough-and-tumble winger would rack up close to 70 penalty minutes. The lovable losers had been rechristened the Amazing Amerks as they made a push for the Stanley Cup playoffs. And, after an improbable string of wins in January and February, it appeared a playoff appearance was a lock after they beat the hated Montreal Maroons 4-2. Bill Dwyer, feeling rather proud of his team and maybe just a little smug about beating a maroon squad that had all but owned the Americans previously, decreed from his private forest hotel fortress that his hockey players deserve some relaxation. With this edict, he also delegated some of the boys look after the hockey players during the outing. The boys were known to many as the somber-looking men in double-breasted overcoats and sporting fedoras. The double-breasted overcoats were tailored to provide room for shoulder holsters. The boys loaded the hockey players into the first four cars in a string of six black limos waiting in front of the hotel. The last two cars were loaded with Bill Dwyer's very best bottled stock. The party at Dwyer's horse farm in New Jersey should have gone well and in fact was going well until Red Dutton started to brag. Yeah, the problem with being a successful Americans team is uh, the ability to celebrate is like no other. Um, you, you have the source of, uh, of all sorts of liquid pleasure available through your ownership. And so as a result, before the season is yet over, uh, they decide to, to throw a party. And you know, so the story goes, um, there's a tremendous amount of liquor. Uh, they're out at uh, one of Dwyer's places. He happens to have a stable, and they happen to have horses. And liquor and horses don't usually mix, but it seems that you put liquor and horses with hockey players, it, it is even a worse combination. And unfortunately, uh, one of the stars of the team, uh, George Patterson, ends up with a broken arm um, and on injured reserve. And ultimately, uh, I, I believe they tie with the Montreal Maroons uh, at the end of the season. Roy Werders would later recall that Patterson's injury all but doomed the Americans' chance to finish in the playoffs. 
That finished us for the season, Warders would tell reporters years later. George was our best right winger. We won only four of our remaining games and the Montreal Maroons edged us out of the final playoff spot. Mr. Dwyer never again invited the hockey players to a celebration party at his farm. Patterson's tumble was fodder for the gossip columns as well. Ed Sullivan, who would become famous as both Sunday night TV host and the man who introduced North American teens to Elvis and the Beatles, was still a newspaper writer during the 30s. In his Broadway column, Sullivan noted, G. Patterson, scoring ace of Bill Dwyer's ice hockey team, broke his arm in Lakewood, New Jersey, horseback riding. After a season split between the Americans and the minor league New Haven Eagles in an effort by New York to get Patterson's game back after his late 1931 injury, he was back in familiar New York Americans colors to start the 1932-1933 season. Dwyer welcomed him back. Try and make this a winning season start tonight, even though it be an exhibition game. Patterson would skate to one of his best seasons, posting 19 points for the Americans. Yeah, on the Americans, and he had a he had a very good five year run um, with the Americans. Uh, he, he was uh, a, a stable center of that team. Um, you know, a, a team that that necessarily, because of its ownership, tended to be chaotic. Those players who were stable. Uh, who were even keeled, who could produce over time, uh, tended to play a very important role on the team. And historically, you know, Dwyer was a hands-on owner. Uh, and in fact, arguably, he was maybe too hands-on an owner. So when there was a player who he felt you could build on, uh, he took a liking to those players. He let those players know that he cared about them. Um, and, and it's not surprising that in the case of, of George uh, that uh, he would find a home and more importantly, become a mainstay of that team, which in the late 20s and early 30s was really looking to figure out who they were and what their future held. In Toronto, Conn Smythe's hockey kingdom was faring better than Dwyer's crumbling Manhattan hockey dreams. Smythe had gambled figuratively and literally to build his Maple Leafs from a club which had struggled on and off the ice as the St. Pats to a nationally recognized team on the cusp of greatness in the early 30s. On November 12, 1931, a standing room only crowd of 15,000 plus fans welcomed the team to their new home, Maple Leaf Gardens. After the pomp and ceremony befitting the opening night of Canada's new ice palace, the Leafs lost 2-1 to one to Chicago. Even the valiant play of King Clancy, Hap Day, and goaltending of Lorne Shabbat couldn't save the home team on this night. The Leafs' lone score came in the second period when Charlie Conacher took a pass from Joe Primo, barged past the Chicago defense, and slipped the puck beyond the reach of Blackhawks goalie Charlie Gardiner for the tally wrote the Toronto Daily Star. Despite the opening night loss, the Leafs soon made Maple Leaf Gardens a tough arena to play in for visiting teams. Backed by a talented and gritty core of players including Harvey Jackson, Charlie Conacher, Ace Bailey and King Clancy, the Leafs skated to the Stanley Cup Finals in the spring of 1932. On an April night, a crowd of 14,336, what the Toronto Daily Star referred to as the Carlton Street Palais de Glace, and then, according to the account, went early into a general mob hysteria as the Maple Leafs larouped the New York Rangers 6-4 to four, and won their first Stanley Cup in the grand finale of the greatest hockey season Toronto has ever experienced. With that, the Leafs had swept away the New York Rangers to win their first championship. It would be another decade before Conn Smythe's team would hoist the Stanley Cup again. Tragedy would strike the Leafs in 1933 when on December 12th, star player Ace Bailey was injured during a riot-inducing game against the Bruins at Boston Garden. Games between the Leafs and Bruins had become chippy affairs even before the December 12th match. Even off the ice, there had been a long, simmering feud between Smythe and Art Ross, the man who had built the Bruins into a bruising squad who won the Stanley Cup in 1929. According to accounts of the game, the Leafs and Bruins were tied and the Leafs killing a two-man penalty. 
Eddie Shore, a powder keg on skates for the Boston Bruins at the best of times, was not having a good game on this night. His frustrations only increased when Smythe sent out Bailey, sporting number six, the same number George Patterson had worn when he had scored the first goal for the Leafs back in 1927, along with Clancy and the team's designated scrapper, Horner. Bailey managed to kill half the two-minute penalty himself, playing a game of keep away with the puck that frustrated the Bruins and enraged Shore before dumping the puck into Boston's end and coasting back to the Leafs' blue line for rest. Shore picked up the puck and started to skate toward the Leafs' net, where Horner and Clancy both descended on him. Both later took credit for the hit that dumped Shore and allowed Clancy to skate away with the puck. For Shore, it was the final frustration on the night. He skated for the nearest leaf. Ace Bailey, still catching his breath, never saw him coming. The sound of the crack from Bailey's head hitting the ice was so loud it echoed through the arena, bringing the crowd to a stunned silence. The Toronto player lay almost motionless, except for the involuntary twitching of his legs. Horner went straight for shore punching him so hard he fell straight back, hitting his head on the ice, a pool of blood forming. He actually got ran by another player on the team, and he thought he thought it was Ace Billy who hit him. He ran after him, hit him, banged his head in the ice, fractured skull, knocked out. And then Eddie Shore got knocked out himself because the Leafs all jumped him and, and impounded him like a good team should. After weeks in hospital recovering in which he came close to death, Bailey eventually recovered and returned home. He never played hockey again. An all-star game was organized to generate funds for Bailey, and Smythe gave him a job for life within the Leafs organization. Bailey held the job until old age, when Harold Ballard, in one of his coldest acts, fired the elderly man as soon as Con Smythe was dead and couldn't come to his old friend's defense. On the night of the All-Star Game, Smythe decreed Bailey's number six be retired by the Leafs, making the Leafs the first major sports team to retire a jersey number. George Patterson started the 1933-1934 season with the New York Americans. He had no idea he wouldn't finish the year with them. Patterson would struggle with only three goals in 13 games before being traded to the Boston Bruins along with Lloyd Gross for Art Chapman and Bob Gracie on January 11, 1934. He was heading back to the team that had waived him so quickly when he was injured in 1929, and he was starting the journey of so many good hockey players, he was about to slowly fade away from the NHL. He rose and... Uh, to certain heights during his career at, 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 in various levels, but he, he somehow wore out his welcome in some in places and moved on. Uh, he must have covered maybe a, a dozen places, a dozen cities in his career. Midway through the 1934-1935 season, Patterson was traded to Detroit, where he only played seven games before being moved again to his final NHL club, the St. Louis Eagles. He would finish the year with the Buffalo Bisons in the minors, picking up 19 points in 28 games. His journeyman existence would see Patterson play for five minor league teams in the next eight seasons. In 1937-1938, he would be named an all-star in the AHA while playing at a point-a-game pace for the Minneapolis Millers. In the early 40s, he would score 52 points in back-to-back seasons with the New Haven Eagles. And in 1942-1943, Patterson would string together 50 points again in a season split between New Haven and Indianapolis. He would never again get a call to play for an NHL team. For Patterson's family, the constant travel and bouncing from team to team was taking a toll. Friends came and went, you know, as kids do and we were lucky enough to grow up in the same neighborhood they didn't have that and they would have been moving on again and then coming back in the winter time and or the summertime and uh, getting reacquainted with the kids only to have to take off again as the 1940s continued war in europe and the pacific waged on canada's war efforts especially were playing havoc with the nhl as young healthy hockey players turned in their hockey sticks for rifles just as they had during the Great War. 
The Toronto Maple Leafs beat the Detroit Red Wings in seven games in the spring of 1942, capturing their second Stanley Cup. Pete Langell scored the final goal of Game 7 as the Leafs won 3-1 to at Maple Leaf Gardens, capping off an improbable come-from-behind series win in which they had been down three games to none. It was the final goal of Langell's career. He joined the Army and never played professional hockey again. It's time to leave the uh, comfort of home, which I think to them was out in Joyceville at that time, and we're going to spend the winter this time in Hershey. And now we've got to learn American history. Everything we learned last year isn't going to be applicable this school year, so we'll have to learn that again. In 1943, the company town of Hershey, Pennsylvania, built on the chocolate sales of Milton Hershey and his dream of an ideal community, was bustling. The war had stifled the company's use of sugar, but led to bigger profits through the sale of specially formulated chocolate-flavored bars for ration kits to the American Armed Forces. The Hershey Company's workforce had almost tripled to meet demand. Most of the workers were women, as men were in short supply. This was the Hershey that greeted George Patterson and his family when he arrived in town that fall to lace up his skates and play hockey for the hometown Hershey Bears. So Milton Hershey has a town that is building and growing because of his, his chocolate and his industry. So he does various things to um, make uh, social activity for the, the, the townsfolk. And one of the reasons he decided to build an arena and have a hockey team. So he built the, a building that already existed at Convention Hall. He decided to put some ice down and then had a scrimmage. It was so successful that they decided that Hershey should have their own hockey team. So they started and had an amateur hockey team. And it existed from 32 until 1938 in an amateur organization. And it was so successful and people attended it so much that he decided that they need to build a real hockey rink. And it built from a 2,000-seat arena to a 7,200-seat arena at the Hershey Park Arena that was built in 36. When he stepped on the ice for the first time, Patterson was skating on an ice surface that rivaled those in the NHL. Milton Hershey had been the one who pushed for the club's move from its cramped first home to the stately, modern Hershey Park Arena, known in the mid-30s as Hershey Sports Arena. The... The story goes, true or not, is that uh, one day Milton Hershey went to attend the game and it was sold out and there wasn't a seat to be had. He wasn't able to attend his own hockey game. He left the rink, vowed to his driver, he's going to build a rink so large that there'll never be uh, a person turned away again. The result was the Hershey Park Arena with 7,200 seats, which was monstrous in his day, especially considering the town. As a team, these Bears were still developing an identity. They were a young squad with a few veterans sprinkled through the lineup. Just as he had been with the New York Americans, Patterson quickly proved a stabilizing influence with Hershey. He also chipped in on the score sheet. So influential was Patterson, he was moved to center, away from the wing he had patrolled most of his career, and named co-captain of the team. He would tally 46 points in 48 games for the Bears during the 1943-1944 season. For Hershey specifically, they were still, I'll say, finding their way because they were still um, related to the amateur organization and now professionals. So they're out trying to recruit the professionals, as it were. And it wasn't uh, back then nearly as uh, linear and distinct now with the minor leagues and the NHL, where every... American League club has an NHL franchise. It was the best players are in the NHL, and then the American League clubs are out trying to find the next best players to play in their league, whether it's the young and -and up-and-coming players or, in fact, some of the older veterans near the end of their career. So when you began the season, many of those years, it would be, say, a hodgepodge of players trying to find out what your team would consist of. Fred Hergertz tallied the lone Hershey goal last night, while Fred Turier, Fred Hung, Larry Tebow, Roger Leger, and Bobby Walton each counted for Buffalo. In the last period, major penalties were meted out to Billy Moe, Bear defenseman, and Walter Atanas for instigating a fight. 
When George Patterson of Hershey joined the melee, he received a 10-minute misconduct penalty and a $75 fine from referee Billy Holmes. The Evening News, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, February 14, 1944. Even with their slow fade, the Hershey Bears made the playoffs that year. Patterson chipped in a goal and an assist in seven games before the club was eliminated. The following season would be Patterson's last season as a professional hockey player. Splitting his time between Hershey and Providence, he would score 26 goals and 33 assists. During his time with Hershey, he would also suffer a frightening on-ice injury during a shift change when he skated into the door on the player's bench. At that time, the doors all opened out onto the ice surface. Patterson's injury caused leaders of the game to rethink the workings of the doors on player benches, and they no longer open out onto the ice. As Patterson's career came to an end, the Toronto Maple Leafs were starting a run of Stanley Cup success that would earn them four championships in five years. We've got the first dynasty, 1947, 48, 49, and then 1951 as well. So four Stanley Cup championships in five years. It's a glorious time. It's a young team. They've all grown together. And you you see a bit of a template with the Edmonton Oilers in the 1980s, for example. But all young players, all been scouted. We've got Hap Day behind the bench, at least for the first part of it as well. Con Smythe has got firm control of the team. Even though he didn't necessarily have the title of general manager, he was, in fact, the de facto general manager of the team, calling all the shots. Wednesday, March 14, 1951, was shaping up to be one of the most important dates in the history of Kingston sports. This was the date the newly constructed Memorial Center would open its doors to the public and host its first hockey game. Before tonight, hockey teams in Kingston relied on Queens and Royal Military College for an indoor ice surface of this caliber. A crowd of over 1,700, including Captain Sutherland, rose from sold-out seats for the opening ceremonies. Centerman Kenny Artsopartis skated forward wearing the striped jersey of the Kingston Nylons to take the ceremonial face-off against the Belleville Redmond center Jack Wardaw. Partis was a 13-year veteran, having played hockey in Kingston and semi-pro hockey in the U.S. OHA President Jack Roxborough stepped forward, congratulated Kingston on the magnificent achievement of the new arena and dropped the ceremonial puck. Eight months later, Roxborough would be back in Kingston seeking answers for how the Nylons had qualified for the series with Belleville. Over 14,000 fans watched as the Nylons bested the Redmonds four games to three before losing four straight to the eventual OHA Senior B champs, Brantford. Outside of opening the Memorial Center, the Kingston Nylons' place in Kingston hockey history would have been forgotten, except for the series of events that unfolded in the summer of 1951. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the OHA and the CHA agreed to let senior B teams play a uh, challenge for the, sta- for the Allen Cup for the Senior Championship of Canada. And some of them figured out that 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 would shorten their, their playoff career and 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 would would uh, reduce any income that they they received late in the summer of 1951 a number of players on the nylon squad came forward with complaints about coaching and the playing time they were getting this happened during the same period patterson was trying to secure a senior b franchise for himself which he would operate out of kingston his son who had played on the Nylon squad, as well as the team's goalies and several other players, had followed Patterson. OHA President Roxborough came back to Kingston to investigate. After a quick hearing held at the Memorial Centre, he ordered a more formal set of hearings for October. Kingston's LaSalle Hotel hosted the fall hearings, with Roxborough and colleagues staking a claim to a meeting room. A long list of Kingston Nylons players were called on to give what amounted to testimony. The proceedings focused on the disclosure of a loose understanding the Nylons would be better off losing to the more powerful Peterborough Peets. This way, they could avoid elimination in the Allen Cup Senior A Series and continue in Senior B. Whether entry into the so-called Allen Cup Series is or isn't worth the effort is a contentious point. But there are those who believe that the CAHA executive has made a monumental blunder 
and has cheapened the series to remarkable extent. The paying public will decide that issue eventually. Mike Rodden, Sports Editor, Whig Standard. On the surface, the Nylons appeared to be a Team United. Just below, they were a team of individuals with their own agendas and easily splintered when put to the test. Even though they had easily locked up second place and a chance to play for the Allen Cup, the trophy for senior hockey in Canada, when they beat the Kingston Combines back in the spring, the players on the team seemed to be putting their personal finances before any greater glory. The night of the win over the Combines, a victory celebration was held at George Patterson's house. Here, events began to unfold that would lead to one of the darkest moments in Kingston hockey. If we wanted to play Senior A, we would have entered Senior A, lamented Joe Watts when asked about the night's events years later. When D.L. McKnight and I, and most of the players, left the Patterson house, it had been resolved that the OHA had, by that rule, put us in a position that we had no incentive to win. That is a long way from throwing the series. In fact, it was an excellent series. When testifying at the hearing, Robert Joyce said the evening was a party not a meeting. The hearing stirred up events from the summer when George Patterson was fired as coach of the Nylons by his own players, many of whom were disgruntled by their lack of playing time. Some of the players who had defected from the Nylons in the hope of playing with George on his new team stood with them resolute. In front of the seven-man panel, Coach Patterson confirmed the allegations. Twelve players, including four players who requested their release from the Nylons to play on a new team with Patterson, denied any fix. John Patterson, no relation, who had been cut out of his full share of the playoff money, sided with the father-son Patterson duo. George Patterson was given a lifetime suspension from the game he loved. Twelve players were suspended for the season. Two players who first admitted to match-fixing then under pressure, changed their story, were suspended two years. The OHA refused to reveal any of the evidence it had on how the team agreed to let Peterborough win. It just maintained the Patterson charges were fully proven. Mere words can hardly express the genuine regret felt by local sportsmen and by this observer following the exposure of the nylon hockey scandal and the flaunting of honest endeavor and ethics by those who follow the darkest star when temptation came their way. That this disaster should occur in the city where the International Hockey Hall of Fame will stand is indeed ironical and pathetically tragic. There will be many who will deeply regret that George Patterson has been given a life sentence as a star player with the Kingston Juniors 25 years ago and later as a professional in the American and National Leagues. No black mark was ever charged against George Patterson's name. This observer, who refereed many games in which George played, recalls no incident in which he did not give the best he had to give or in which he flaunted authority or the rules. Two years ago, I recommended George Patterson as a referee to Clarence Campbell, president of the NHL. I remain convinced he would have made the grade, but now that book has been closed, perhaps never to be reopened for an old soldier of the ice lanes who may have erred, but who told the truth in his hour of trial. Mike Rodden. Nylon shattered, screamed the headline of the Kingston Whig. Mike Rodden wrote columns and the hockey community was divided as the story spread nationwide. The consensus was the OHA overreacted, influenced by recent gambling scandals in basketball and other sports. In Toronto, the Leafs made headlines as well. So the 1950s were a dark era for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Bill Barocco scores the Stanley Cup winning goal in 1951, and and the city is on fire with the claim for the great hero, the tragic young hero, and for the Toronto Maple Leafs team. And then it wasn't until 11 years later when they won another Stanley Cup championship, and that's a long time to wait, although... As a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, I've waited a whole lot longer than that. But 11 years, and when they found, ironically, Bill Barocco's body again, that's when uh, the team had its upswing. Con Smythe, 
began to lose interest in the Leafs, distracted more and more by outside interests. This allowed a changing of the guard at Maple Leaf Gardens in 1957 when Harold Ballard and John Bassett came in as owners along with Stafford Smythe. Back in Kingston, George Patterson, a man who was once being groomed as a future coach or even the future NHL referee, continued to retreat from hockey. Uh, I think it saddened him a lot, and he, he, the only contact I had, he was a very gruff old gentleman. <laughs> he, uh, he, and he didn't, he, he didn't, he wasn't able to celebrate this long career that he had in hockey because, because of that uh, suspension. In the spring of 1967, the Toronto Maple Leafs celebrated another Stanley Cup win. It was an improbable victory over the Montreal Canadiens, one led by a group of aging veterans that capped a 1960s dynasty for Toronto. They were aware that this was going to be the last year of the old six-team league, and winning a Stanley Cup in the last year of the old six-team league would have been a real accomplishment. So I think there was some, at the start of the season, that this is our sort of our last chance before expansion and all those things. Um, it was also um, Canada's birthday, uh, so that was all uh, something in the back of everybody's mind as well. And Expo was in Montreal, and I don't think we wanted them to have the cup uh, for Expo. Absent from the celebrations for the 67 Cup was Con Smythe. He had long removed himself from the day-to-day -day operations of Maple Leaf Gardens. He had sold his interest in the team to Stafford, his son, hoping he had picked a strong successor. Stafford Smythe, Harold Ballard, and John Bassett take over the Toronto Maple Leafs. All of a sudden, they saw Maple Leaf Gardens as a cash cow. And there were a number of things that were changed. They reduced the size of some of the seats, got rid of some of the areas, put more seats in so they could get more revenue from Maple Leaf Gardens as far as seating goes. They all of a sudden started to take sponsorship money. There were a number of things that were going on at that particular time, most of them legal. Gone was the large picture of the Queen, so important to the elder Smythe. Sponsorship money was now flowing in, as was money from liquor sales from the newly constructed hot stove lounge. What bothered Con Smythe most was Ballard booking a heavyweight bout between Canadian George Chevalo and Muhammad Ali. Ali was considered by many at the time a draft dodger and militant Muslim. A fight that isn't good enough for Chicago or Montreal isn't good enough for Maple Leaf Gardens. I cannot go along with the policy of management to put cash ahead of class. I have no control over the policies of present management, so the only alternative is to disassociate myself from it. Con Smythe. Yeah, Connie, Con Smythe certainly made that statement. Uh, and to some degree, at some degree, I think he was correct. Uh, there was a lot, again, going on around us uh, with Ballard and Smythe now. Um, you could see they were adding more seats, trying to squeeze in as many seats as they could into the gardens. They were trying to build these private boxes, and it just looked like they were, um, you know, really going after the dollar. Smythe was about to slide into the shadows of hockey, much like George Patterson, the player who had scored the first goal for his newly minted Toronto Maple Leafs back in 1927. Before slipping away, he had one more parting shot to deliver. This one was aimed at NHL President Clarence Campbell. The subject was NHL expansion, which Smythe once supported in a limited form and as a means of stabilizing the league. He had no use for expansion in its current form. We expanded 40 years ago, and I say this to Clarence Campbell. If you knew what was coming, you'd wipe that grin off your face, he said during a Hall of Fame event. Smythe was right. The new NHL would be one of bigger salaries, lawyers, agents, negotiations, and complexities few had foreseen. It would prove disastrous for the Leafs. So in 1968 arose, uh, there was a big transition. Uh, the guys who were coming off the Stanley Cup who have aged. Um, the, the, the game of hockey was changing. Uh, Al Eagleson had put his foot in the door. 
the management was losing its grip on ownership of the players. Uh, there was such big movements in the National Hockey League at that time that um, it was kind of scary for management, and, and nobody knew how to grasp that. And Punch Imlach and Stafford Smythe and Harold Ballard were starting to have their issues. As the 70s unfolded, Harold Ballard took more control of both the Leafs and Maple Leaf Gardens. Each passing year saw a further squandering of the history and legacy built under Smythe. In Kingston, George Patterson resigned himself to a quiet life, spending most of his time at a cozy family cottage near the St. Lawrence River. Redemption came for Patterson when the OHA absolved him of any wrongdoing in the 1951 Kingston Nylons match-fixing case. On January 16, 1977, after a lengthy illness, George Patterson died at Hotel Dieu Hospital in Kingston. His death... Roughly a month before the Leafs were to celebrate their 50th anniversary, made local and national headlines. To further illustrate how little the Leafs of the 70s knew of their own past, the team's PR director made the very public blunder of challenging the Globe and Mail's obituary of Patterson. For the fans and players, the 80s brought an even greater disconnect between the Leafs and their collective history. Nobody recognized this more than the team's young captain, Rick Vive. I think when you walk into a dressing room, like you said, in Montreal, where it's always on display, uh, who the great players were and who played for the organization and, and all the players that were on all those Stanley Cup teams. And uh, I, I, think it, I think when you walk in there and you, you, you're putting on that sweater and you see all that, I, I think it makes you appreciate where you are and and uh, probably makes you play uh, that much uh, harder because knowing the people that preceded you and what they accomplished uh, I think that has a lot to do with it and unfortunately none of that was on display uh, in our dressing room and in at Maple Leaf Gardens uh, nothing at all really as the 90s dawned so did a new era for the Leafs the team was competitive again, and new management seemed focused on bringing the club's past back into focus. When I got there, that was the Fletcher era, and uh, he brought Daryl Sittler back in, and uh, a lot of guys, um, a lot of alumni. He, he wanted the alumni to be a big part of it, and uh, it was great to see it because, you know, every day, you know, there's different things that go on, and, and sometimes as every athlete think they got the all the right answers but they don't yeah it's been uh it's been a real nice change uh it's uh i think it's one that that uh is going to continue and, and even get better and uh you know because it's uh it, it's necessary i i really do i believe that uh if you're going to have a, a franchise that's going to be successful the past has to be part of it and uh especially the past, the successes of the past, it has to be part of the future. As the Toronto Maple Leafs became more corporate and made the move from Maple Leaf Gardens to the modern and sterile Air Canada Centre, the team rushed to excise its demons. But along the way, it lost even more of its history. Forgotten in the shuffle to modernity, George Patterson. Well, it should be there. There's no question. Uh, it was probably there. Uh, a point out of fact when the uh, Maple Leaf Gardens dissolved and went to MLSE where it is today a lot of artifacts went by the wayside um, uh, Patterson's name was in the dress room on the roster list that I can remember uh, a lot of those things at that time didn't mean much to anybody during the 2016-2017 season, the Toronto Maple Leafs will celebrate their 100th anniversary. It's an arbitrary date that ignores 1927 and Patterson's first goal. It also ignores the 50th anniversary of the team, celebrated in 1977. With Legends Row in place, the Leafs have started the process of creating a permanent memorial to their past. I think they, they could do a lot more with, with pictures and... Uh, maybe little plaques on 
as we're just t talking about here with Mr. Patterson, something to say, oh, that's cool, because I didn't know that. And um, to me, it's just something that's very, uh, very, very important for you know, new generation to look back at the, the past history. The 100th anniversary is coming up. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, stuff about the history of the franchise over that period of time. Uh, and, you know, bringing some of the old players back and, and, and uh, having nights for them and stuff like that. Maybe not just nights for them, but nights to display the, the, for the fans and, and for the current players, you know, who, the, who these guys are and what they did for this organization. And I think that's going to be a big, big part of the fan. Mike Babcock is big on that as well. And I think between them, I, I think that this is only going to get bigger and better. Uh, so I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And I, I think it's going to be good for the franchise. Meanwhile, in Kingston, repeated efforts to have Patterson, a player who led his city to its only Memorial Cup appearance, scored the first goal in an NHL franchise's history, was an MVP and two-time All-Star in the AHL, recognized by an enshrined in the local Sports Hall of Fame, have met with rejection. I think enough is enough after a certain point. And given what he had accomplished during his career, that is significant enough to merit uh, consideration in the Kingston Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, I think that uh, to be uh, damning of the individual forever is a bit churlish and a bit much. Is George Patterson destined to be a hockey trivia question? For his surviving family members, the hope is he will be more than a bit of trivia tossed about during an anniversary game or at a pub. But I think he's got to be recognized in some way, and I'm not sure how that is. A plaque? Uh, scoring the first goal in Maple Leafs history is something to be remembered. An asterisk is the way it's being remembered right now, but I think it's got to go beyond that. They remain hopeful the Toronto Maple Leafs will find a small way to recognize the man who scored the goal that launched their franchise. And they remain cautiously optimistic Patterson will someday find a home in Kingston's Sports Hall of Fame. But up and coming is what you read in some of the old articles. A player to look out for. He's going places. Um, just trying to remember all those headlines that are fading away now that i got in a collection of moms yeah he's got to be recognized you know like any other player and he should be he should be we certainly want we certainly want that